Good morning from the kitchen folks. Today I'm going to attempt to make a super strong and very hoppy IPA. So here are my key ingredients and you'll note that I'm making this IPA from an extract kit. I'm using the John Bull beer kit. I've never used this kit before ever. It's my first time but of course I need to pimp it because I'm not satisfied having things as they are. So alongside my John Bull beer kit, I'm going to be adding 500 grams of medium spray malt. I'm going to be adding a kilo of Demerara unrefined cane sugar to give it some nice toasty sweetness. I'm going to add in a kilo of dextrose monohydrate brewing sugar. All of this collectively is going to pump that ABV upwards. My yeast of choice today is the yeast that comes with the Jumble Beer Kit. It's not identified as to what it is. I'm using two kinds of hops, Brewer's Gold and Citra. I've got 70 grams of Brewer's Gold and I'm going to complement that with another 50 grams of Citra. So this is going to be a hop fest. That was my hop symbol, by the way. Uh, I'm going to add a bit of pectolase. I don't know whether I'm wasting my time doing this, but it, just in case this causes haziness in the brew, hopefully that might help to ease that. And I'm going to be adding some Young's yeast nutrient. Alongside all of this, I'm going to be adding somewhere between 20 and 23 litres of spring water. And I'm using spring water because the tap water where I am is quite chlorine -y. My fermentation vessel of choice today is Big Betty, my Kegland flat-bottomed Firmzilla, which is currently sanitising. Okay, so you'll notice that I've got two big pots on my hob. I'm going to put five litres of spring water into each one. This is going to be a full day's brew. I'm taking my time and doing it slowly. And I'll explain why as I'm going along. So there's my water in my big pots. So my next job is to get the heat on and get this water warming. In my small pot, I'm going to make some hot tea. Now annoyingly, I did have some hot tea bags, some reusable ones, and can I find them? Can I egg? So I'm going to actually use hot pellets and I'm just going to put it in the water and then I'm going to strain this before I put it into the fermenting vessel. Now these hops are actually quite old. I've had these open for a good few months and they've definitely lost a lot of their smell, which is why I'm supplementing them with some citra. I probably wouldn't have normally added so many hops into the brew, but these have lost their potency. There's 70 grams in there and I'm gonna, I would have added maybe 20 or 30 grams of these but I'm going to add 50 grams of these because I really do want that hoppiness to come through. So that's what the hot pellets look like. Basically like marijuana. Or Mary Jane. Funnily enough, I read this week that if you burn hot pellets, it has the same smell as Mary Jane as well. But let's not be experimenting now, kids. I've just opened my fresh citra. Oh, wow. That's fabulous. I love that smell. So I'm going to weigh out 50 grams. That'll do. And then in that goes to my tea as well. I'm going to pop this lid on. And this pan is now done for the time being. Okay, I'm now back to my big pan and I'm going to add my kilo of brewing sugar into that. I'm just going to tip it in. And this will dissolve quite easily. I'm just going to give it a little stir around. As the water warms up, this doesn't take long to dissolve at all. I won't add any more sugars in until I can see that this has dissolved. So let's have a look. And you can see now that that's nice and clear. So I've got my kilogram of brown sugar, which I'm now going to add in there. I don't think I've ever used brown sugar in a brew. Maybe I have, I can't remember, but I'll tell you what, it's got a lovely smell, it's got a lovely sort of rich carameliness to it, which I'm hoping will impart some flavours into the brew, rather than just bump the ABV up. This doesn't dissolve as easily as the brewing sugar either. And that's now all in there, give that a stir around. 
you can see it's immediately changed the colour of the water. And I can feel it scraping along the bottom of the pan, so I'm going to need to keep moving that around so it doesn't burn and stick. This will dissolve, it's just going to take a little while. So I'm just waiting for the brown sugar to dissolve and I'm having a little read on the very basic instructions that come with the extract kit. But what I like on this is, it says that if you brew it short, brew it to 18 litres and not the 23 litres it's supposed to be, that it becomes a stout. That seems a bit extreme, doesn't it? Going from an IPA to a stout. So I'm quite surprised about that and maybe that's going to be a good future experiment. Has anyone ever done that? If so, kind of tell me in the comments how it turned out. Anyway, I'm intending to add somewhere between 20 and 23 litres. I'm not quite sure where it will end up yet. So it's hopefully going to be nearer an IPA than a stout because I've just brewed a stout anyway. Okay, my brown sugar seems to have largely dissolved. That's looking pretty good, isn't it? It's a lovely colour. This is about 10 minutes later. Okay, I'm now going to add my medium spray malt into this. And this is a bit lumpy and clumpy when it goes in. As you can see just there, it will break up and dissolve. you just got to play with it a bit. So this one just takes a little bit more effort than the other two. Not, nothing major. It's already breaking up now. Okay, I'm going to leave this for the next 10 minutes and then come back to it. So we've got a nice milky white surface. That you can see underneath it it's brown like beer spray malt is 99% dissolved so let's get the beer kit open I always have a nightmare with tin openers I wonder if it'll work this time last one I did no. dreadful Do you know what oh got it right will it hold oh now it's turning it's going and that seems to have done the trick. Right, let's see if it works how it's supposed to. And it does. This is the first time ever. Wow. So I don't want to waste what's on the underside of the lid. So I'm just going to scrape that back in there. Yeah. It's like black treacle, I'll show you. So that is the inside of the John Bull IPA beer kit. And this is now getting tipped into there. Blob. Look at that. Oh, I can understand why it might make a stout if you brew it short. Looking at that. Flipping egg. That is ribbons. I think this might take a while. And this, kids, is today's brew hack. Okay, I've emptied the extract kit as much as I can. This is where it is currently. I'm just boiling the kettle and I'm going to put a bit of boiling water in the bottom to dissolve what's left around the edges. So just pour that in. It will build some steam up. So I've poured that to about there. I'll put this bowl on top. That will build steam up and everything in there will dissolve into the tin. Right, let's have a look inside there. Ah, I think that's pretty much steamed off. So using my oven gloves, in that goes. Don't forget the tin is as hot as the boiling water that went in there. So this is now what I've got in my pan. Everything that's in there is dissolved. It feels really nice and buoyant. And at this point, I'm going to turn off the heat. Only on this one. That one's still going. I'm going to pop the lid on to keep any contaminants out and I'm going to leave that now for several hours. This is now done for the time being. Now another nice little hack for you. I keep these tins, I just take the labels off. So they usually peel off okay. Okay, so the label's mostly off, but what do I do with it? I'll show you. Here's one that I used last time. I just stand beer bottles in there that have got labels on and I float the labels off. And if the label doesn't float off, it just takes a bit of a scrape with a knife 
after a couple of days. So when I've done the body labels on that one, I'll just put the bottle in upside down and do the one on the neck. Another tip. We'll have a look at the hoppy tea, see what's going on with that. And it looks like pea soup. And that's exactly what I wanted. So I want the hops to dissolve and I want all the oils to come out of them. And I want this water to be really, really hoppy flavoured. So I'm going to leave this with the lid on to let it simmer. I can really smell that coming out now, actually. And I'll come back to you in a bit. Okay, it's 30 minutes later, daylight outside. I've got breakfast on the go. And let's have a look at those hops. Steamy. Right, it's now looking like mushy peas. I'm satisfied that they're done. So I'm gonna turn that off and I'm gonna let that stand and what we call steep now for a few hours. Probably actually, I might leave it all day long and pick this up this evening. And in case you're wondering what we're having for breakfast, steak, mushroom, courgette, tomato, and there'll be a couple of poached eggs. Can't go wrong with that. Right, I'll catch up with you in a few hours time. I don't know how long it'll be. It might be tonight, it might be this afternoon. We'll see. And just in case you're wondering, that's how breakfast turned out. Good evening from the kitchen, folks. It's 11 hours later, and I'm almost ready to get this brew together. So these have now cooled down quite nicely. That one's still warm, but this one now is, is almost room temperature, just slightly above it, but certainly not harmful in terms of heat. Um, I'm just emptying the solution out of my Kegland uh, flat bottom firmzilla, and then I'll just need to give it a little rinse with some water afterwards. So basically, we're nearly ready to rock and roll. Okay, it's empty and clean. So it's time to get the show on the road with eight litres of room temperature spring water going into the fermenter. So just while I'm pouring this in, I would like to ask you, have you subscribed to my YouTube page for Moss Home and Garden? If you haven't, I'd really appreciate it if you did. www.mosshomeandgarden.co.uk I've also got a Facebook page for Moss Home and Garden. Again, if you subscribe to that, it makes me happy. Bottle number three. Also, while I'm pimping my social media, I'm on Instagram at Stu Moss, S T U M O W S. Give us a follow, tell me that you've seen this on my channel, and I'll follow you back. Easy as that. This is now litre seven and eight going in there, the last of the cold spring water to begin with. So the Firmzilla comes with a nice uh, measurement sticker, and you can see there. I'm on eight litres. So here's the beer wart. Now the next thing to do is add that into here using a sanitised jug. So we've just got to try and get this in, making as little mess as possible. There's method in my madness of putting the cold water in first. I'm just protecting the firmzilla from any excess heat. It's not really that warm at all now, but because it's plastic, I don't want to damage it. I have seen the uh, damaged, heat damaged Firmzilla's online before and I don't want mine to join that club. The thing I like most about this fermenter is that you can see through it and it's really quite broad. And that means that when it builds a Krausen, the foamy head on top, it doesn't go too tall, it spreads out. So fingers crossed, I've not had an eruption yet, yet. So I'm just approaching 14 litres now and I'm going to finish somewhere between 20 and 23. After I've got this in, I've then got the hop tea to go in. And don't forget, the initial liquid that I had will have been expanded by the fact that I've added the beer kit and I've added all that sugar and spray mould, so the volume has increased because of that. Right, let's go for the dramatic ending. Let's hope it doesn't go everywhere. Just to see if there's anything stuck to the bottom. So, in we go. That went well. Right, I'm now up to 17 litres. I've got to get myself a sieve and a strainer now. 
So in the end, I only needed the strainer. I didn't need the sieve as well because the strainer just fits on here nicely. And I want to use this to strain the hoppy tea, which I've got over here. I don't want all the hot bits going into my beer. So just like with the beer wart, I'm going to begin with the jug. Just trying to keep as tidy as possible. And I'll pour that into the strainer and that will hopefully do the job. Now I can tell you what, the smell of the hops is intense. So hopefully that will have an impact. It's probably an unconventional way to do it this way, but I am unconventional. But because I'm not going to filter this beer afterwards, I'm not going to... I'm going to let it go to secondary, but I'm not going to add any finings or anything like that. And what I don't want is a grainy beer where there's bits of hop in there. So I'm doing it that, this way for that reason. Feel free to tell me in the comments if there's a better way. Remember, I was going to use a hop tea bag, but I can't find it. I've got two of them somewhere and I don't know where the heck they are. So the strainer's doing its job very nicely. Looks like mushy peas. So I'm just compacting what's in the strainer to get the juice out. And obviously with that juice comes flavor. Try adding some more straight from the pan now. I doubt very much I'll be adding any more water after this because I'm already on uh, 21 litres now. Anyway, I'm going to finish this off. It might take a little while because the strainer's getting full. I'll come back to you when I've done. Okay, I think that's finished draining. There's always a little bit. It's like when you go to the loo. Quick shake. Right, nip and tuck, here we go. And in there, and that's what it looks like afterwards. Kind of like ice cream. Anyway, the hops are not wasted. They'll be added to my compost and they'll go on my garden as fertiliser later this year. As for what I've now got in the firmzilla, I need to give this a right good shake around because I could see that it was darker at the bottom and lighter at the top. And I need to take the gravity and it needs to be accurate. So. I'm shaking this around to get it mixed together. You can see it's still darker at the bottom. So I get my big spoon. I've done some spooning. There we go, that does it. That's done the trick. Now the liquid in here is currently 22. I need it at 20 to take the original gravity. It'll take a big thing like this a bit of time to cool down. But if I sacrifice 100ml, pop it in here, shove it in the fridge for 10 minutes, then I'll be at the right temperature. So sacrifice 100ml is what I will do. As neatly as possible. I think it will be practically easier for me to do that over the sink. There we go. So I'm going to pop this in my fridge and then I'll come back to finishing this off. Right, let's get this bad boy put together now. So I'm going to add a couple of generous heaped dessert spoonfuls of pectolase into the mix. I don't know if it's necessary. Tell me in the comments. I use it in wine and cider when I'm adding fruit matter to help it clear. Because I've put the hops in, I didn't want it to finish cloudy. So I'm not sure, but I'm putting it in anyway. It won't hurt. Next, I'm putting in Young's yeast nutrient. And this is a general yeast nutrient for any yeasts. Again, I probably don't need it, but it's not going to hurt, I don't think. So I'll put one, two generous heaped dessert spoonfuls in there. So I'm just going to agitate this a little bit, move that around in there. So it's now time to add the all important yeast. And again, I've mentioned before, this is the yeast that come with the kit. I don't know what sort of yeast it is, but hopefully it's good for making a strong and hoppy IPA. So I'm going to sprinkle that on top, being careful not to get it stuck to the insides of the neck. I think this yeast is going to have an amazing time. It's warm, it's sweet, it's got nutrient, it's got all sorts in it. To be a yeast. 
What a happy life, just making alcohol and bread. Anyway, I'm just giving this a little bit of agitation so the yeast will spread out and then begin to sink. I think that this is going to be a fast fermenter. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if fermentation was over within 10 days. I'm just cleaning the top of the firmzilla now to get any residue out of the uh, thread because what I don't want to happen is when I come to undo this, I can't because it's like glue. And I've had that almost happen to me before. So I'm just trying to clean that down. I'm happy enough with that. I still need to clean this whole vessel, but I'm happy enough with that so far. So I'm going to put the top of the fermenter in place. When you move the firmzilla, I bought these handles as extras. When you move it, undo one of these first. It's just like a pot bottle top. If you do that, when you pick it up, it won't suck the water in from the airlock. Top tip. I'm just going to pop a bit more water in the airlock. That's good. And then get the top of the airlock in place. And finally, the collar. We need to get this on so it's not cross-threaded. That's it. And it spins into place and this holds it all together. Last but not least for now is the all-important rinse. Nothing worse than getting stickiness everywhere. Well, there is, you know, war and famine and stuff like that, but in brewing terms, it's a bit horrible when you get sticky stuff everywhere. Okay, I need to take the gravity when it's cooled down, which will probably be in about five minutes time. Then we'll get this labelled up and that'll be it for now. Catch you in a bit. Okay, I've now got this at the right temperature to take the original gravity. So in goes the hydrometer. Boing. So I'm starting off on an original gravity of 1068, 1.068. So it's definitely going to be strong. Fingers crossed, it'll also be hoppy. Okay, I've got my fermenter labelled up. So I'm just playing the waiting game now until fermentation begins. The recipe is over. I'll give you an update once it starts fermenting. So catch you then. Okay, just a next morning, 12 hours later update. You can see that the fermentation is beginning. There's a little bit of activity on top. The foundations of what will become a Krausen. No activity in the airlock yet that I've noticed. But we'll have an update in about another 12 hours. Okay, this is 24 hours later. And we can say that fermentation is absolutely definitely happening look at that krausen that looks really healthy now temperature wise this is at the lowest end that i want it to be at it's at 18. Um, so what i'm going to do later today is to move this into my office and stand it on a heat mat but for now things are looking good okay here's an update 12 hours later still fermenting nicely now the temperature of this today has fluctuated between 18 and 20, which has not been a bad temperature through the daytime. For fermenting an IPA, that's been pretty good. However, I know at night time, it's definitely gonna get a lot colder in this room. So with that in mind, I've decided not to move this to my office. I'm gonna leave it here on the kitchen side, but I've got it on this heat mat, and the heat mat's plugged in over here in a time plug. And what will happen through the night, so from 1 a.m. until 6 a.m., the heat mat will come on for 30 minutes and then off for 15 minutes, on for 30 minutes, off for 15 minutes. And then in the daytime, it'll be the opposite. So it'll be off for 30 minutes, on for 15 minutes, off for 30 minutes, on for 15 minutes. And I'm hoping that that's going to keep that um, a, nice, a nice temperature. Somewhere around about 20 is what I'm looking for. So that's pretty much it for me now. If anything dramatic happens during fermentation, I'll get back to you. Otherwise, the next film you see from me will be towards the end of fermentation and possibly when I go for racking into demijohns. Okay, catch you later, folks. Good afternoon from the kitchen, folks. It's my hoppy IPA racking day. 
let's have a look at it. And here it is. It's rocking slightly because I've just adjusted the position of this so I could read here. So this has been in the primary fermenter now for 15 days and it's completely and utterly stopped fermenting. It probably stopped after about nine days uh, in truth, but I've left it a little bit longer. I've now got a variety of demijohns draining off or already dry around the kitchen. And today I'm going to be siphoning from that into individual demijohns. So I'm going to begin by undoing one of these caps just here. I won't take the full lid off. And I've got my extra long siphoning tube or my standard siphoning tube with an attachment which I'm going to attempt to clip on here. I've got no idea where the bottom currently is. It's anyone's guess, you can't see through that. Right, here goes nothing. Or hopefully something. It's very milky what's coming through. And it might be that I've got right down into the sediment line. There is a sediment line in the bottom of the fermenter. It's a very mild sediment line, but it's just there. It's about probably a centimetre deep. But the idea of racking today is hopefully that this will clear when I put these demijohns somewhere that's a bit cool. So this one's beginning to get full. And we'll let it go to about there. And into the next one. So you can see that there's positive pressure in the airlock. That means that this is producing CO2. So the beer will be protected by a blanket of CO2 as that will expel the air out through the airlock. This is quite a repetitive process. I've got to do it over again with a few other demijohns. So I'll come back to you when it's done. Okay, so that is looking just about done. Okay, so here is the current situation. These are almost full. There is a little bit of headspace in each one. This one isn't full enough and I'm not happy with the amount of headspace. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to transfer some out of here into each of these which will further reduce how much is in here and then I'm going to do something else with this one. Okay, here goes. And this is eliminating nearly all the headspace which is actually a good thing. So welcome to my entrance porch and this is where my hoppy IPA is going to rack now for probably a month, maybe three weeks, but probably longer. And I want the cool temperature in here to help this to clear and for the matter that's in there to drop down. So I end up with a sediment line and something which is clearer above it. I'm not in any rush with this. So if it takes a bit of time, it takes a bit of time. Just looking on my thermometer, the temperature in here is currently 10 degrees and we are forecast snow for this afternoon, believe it or not. So it will drop because there's no heating in here and that's just the window to the outside world behind those blinds. So that's this lot done, but I've still got that other damage on which isn't quite full. What am I going to do with that? Let's see. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do with the remaining demijohn. I'm going to make a bit of a Frankenstein mixture, but I'm going to add some apple juice from concentrate to it. In fact, I'm going to add one litre, which should hopefully bring this up to about there. And then I'm going to leave it to carry on fermenting because there's extra sugar in this. Now, adding this extra liquid does dilute the ABV. So I need to take that into account when I'm working this out also. So the brew started on 1.068. So I'm just going to pour... So 1.068 to 2. a really healthy drop actually. Wow, this is pretty good. 1.008, so a drop of 60 on the gravity. Okay, I'm going to add my apple juice in there now. And all the sugars in this will definitely reinvigorate that yeast, make it a little bit excited. And that final gravity should drop even further. I'm going to get the airlock back on. It's not quite full the damage on, but once this starts to produce CO2, it will be just fine. And this has only been five minutes and you can already see excitement happening. So I'm just going to work out the ABV as it currently stands. So 1.068 minus 1.008 equals 0 0.06 multiplied by 
equals 7.875%, really healthy. We can say 7.9%. Okay, I've labeled this up now. So it says Apple IPA, 7.9% currently. That's what the gravity currently is. I'll need to take another final gravity at the end, and then I need to dilute it by a litre by how much is here, and a litre for the alcohol by volume as well as the physical volume. It's all a bit complicated maths-wise, but I can do it. I probably didn't explain that very well, but I've been on my feet doing brewing for three hours now, and I need a break. So I'm gonna come back to you when this is looking like it's done, and when the other stuff, which is racking, is looking like it's done. So I'll see you then. So just a quick update 24 hours later, and I thought I'd just show you the difference in the colour at the top and the bottom as this is now beginning to clear. And this is the cold crashing part of the racking process. It's currently six degrees in this porch room. Welcome to the kitchen folks for my least favourite part of the brewing process. It's big bottling day. Let's have a look at that beer. So here it is. It has been racking for two weeks. And I don't know if you can see through this or not, but believe you me, it is very clear. All of the uh, hops that were in there in suspension and all of the bits and pieces have sank to the bottom. Each one of the demijohns has got a very thin line of sediment, no more than kind of a, a centimetre deep, if that. It's a lovely ruby colour and I'm looking forward to trying this one out. So I've sanitised and rinsed my bottles and I've got some ready in the sink to be primed. So in each 500ml bottle I'm going to add a teaspoonful of sugar. This is standard household caster sugar. The sugar is otherwise known as priming sugar and this should mean that my beer will have something of a sparkle. There's a bit of science behind this, but basically the yeast which is left within the beer will have a nibble at that sugar. It will cause a fractional tiny fermentation. A byproduct of that will be CO2. Pressure will build up in the bottle like a soda stream and it should, fingers crossed, be sparkling. In my bigger 750ml bottles, I will add a teaspoon and then a half again. Right, I'll finish these off and then get back to you. So then it is bung out. And then siphoning tube in. Let's rock and roll. So the first bit that's come out is a bit milky, but that's fine. It's gone into my hydrometer jar. Smells really good, proper beery which, generally speaking, is how you would like a beer to smell. Reacting nicely to the priming sugar. Lots of activity. There's life. And on to the next. So just to point out, I'm holding the tube in place with this clip. The bottom of it is down there, just above the sediment line. But like I said, the first bit that did come out that was sedimenty went into there. And this is proper lively stuff. This is definitely going to have a sparkle. I've got no doubt about it. And that's the first demijohn emptied. Okay, I've emptied one of the demijohns and I've got two different kinds of bottles. So I'm going to go through the bottling for just this one demijohn first because then it's a hugely repetitive process with the other three demijohns. So I'll do this one and come back to you when I've done the rest of them. So the first kind of bottle that I've used is one that uses bungs and cages. So your classic champagne style bottle. And I've had these bungs softening in extremely hot water, just under boiling temperature. It makes them malleable so you can push them in a lot easier. The cages are all recycled cages from other champagne, prosecco, sparkling wine, bottles from my wife, neighbours, local micropub, you name it. If I see one in the street, I pick it up, no shame. Recycle. So there you go. So that's the first one done. So that's the first kind of bottle that I've used. The second kind of bottle I've used requires a crown cap. 
These need capping with one of these devices. It just goes down like that. A lot easier said than done sometimes, but if you've got the right kind of bottles, like I think this one is, then it's quite straightforward. Top tip, you're looking for a bottle where you've got a nice amount of space there between the top of the bottle and where the neck is. This collar here, you want quite a deep one. The ones that have got thin collars, like Copperberg bottles, are terrible, but ones like this are generally speaking quite good. I cap downwards into the sink so there's less chance of the bottle slipping. So there you can see I've got the cap magnetically attached to the bottom of the capper. So that goes down on there, and then the levers are pushed downwards, and fingers crossed, this will cap nicely, and it has done. So when it doesn't cap nicely, it slips and it's a right pain, but that has gone absolutely fine. As you can see, that's a nice seal. So I've got absolutely loads more bottles to either bung or cap. You don't need to watch that. You don't need to see me doing the siphoning again. I'll get back to you when this part of the bottling process is over. So just while the siphoning is going on, let's take the final gravity for this brew and then goes the hydrometer. I'm pleased to see that it's sank nicely. And I've finished on a final gravity of 1.010. Anyway, I'm just going to work out the alcohol by volume for this brew. So I want to take the original gravity of 1.068. I'm going to deduct from that the final gravity of 1.010, which equals 0.058. And I'm going to multiply this by 131.25 and this will give me a final alcohol by volume of 7.6%. I think that qualifies as being a strong beer. Okay, I've finished with 27 full bottles and a sampler. I'll come back to that shortly. That's my full bottles. These are all sticky, so I need to give them a rinse and that's now my next job. I want to label these but I want to get all the sticky beer residue off them. Okay so my bottles are all now drying off nicely. Let's go back to my sample bottle. So here's my sample bottle and I'm going to pour it into this. This is not a pint glass, this is a plastic vessel of which it is will become clear shortly. Now this is going to be quite cloudy because what I've actually done is I've added the stuff that was in the hydrometer tube into this which was a bit cloudy. So it's not the full clarity that the final product will be, but it'll still give me a very good idea of flavour. So this belongs to this, and this is how we see what the final beer is going to be like. So I'm going to take my blended beer and pour it into my Leeds Beer Festival pint glass. And you can see when I do this, that this looks like a pint of cask beer. That's like it's just been pulled. And look how the layers begin to develop in it. Can you see that activity? So this is actually going to simulate a pint of cask ale. So I'll finish letting this settle and then I'll come back to you. Okay, here it is. It doesn't look bad, does it? Let's have a little nifter. It tastes like happiness. It's really creamy, but that's because of the way that I've poured it and blended it. It's retained quite a bit of sweetness. A slight nuttiness, but the bittering of the hops really comes through. It does taste like a strong beer. I'm really happy with this. I can't wait for these to carb now. Anyway, I need to get on with making the labels because that's the next step. I've got my bottle labels made up in a very simple Microsoft Word template. I just need to print these out. Right, I've got quite a few bottles to label. 27, I believe it was, to be precise. So I'm just doing that now. I like the bottles to look nice. It's nice to make a good job of it, isn't it? Three down, 24 to go. I shall be back shortly. And there it all is, nicely labelled. Well, I'm not going very far today to condition these beers because this is where they're going to condition. 
So we're now getting towards spring and it's getting a lot warmer in my living room. So I'm going to condition these beers for a month above my drinks cabinet. Now you'll notice in the top of the drinks cabinet, there's some bulbs so that it's warm on top of here. The bulbs come on every evening and they're on for about four hours. And that's going to be enough for that to condition. Plus the daytime ambient temperature in here will be around about 18, 19 anyway. So the conditioning process is where the sugar that I've put in there gets eaten by the yeast, tiny fermentation takes place, CO2 produced, that's what gives it a sparkle. The flavour will develop too. I'm hoping for a really good, tasty, hoppy brew, fingers crossed. So the next film that you see from me will be in about a month's time when it comes to opening and tasting. So I'll catch you then folks. Good evening from the kitchen folks. It's my strong, hoppy IPA grand opening night. Here it is. It's been conditioned in the bottle for one month. The bung has raised by about one and a half to two millimetres. I don't know if you can see that, which suggests to me that carbonation should have happened. Fingers crossed. Remember, this one's been conditioning on top of my drinks cabinet in the living room, not on my normal conditioning shelves, which were full. So it's not had the same amount of heat for the same amount of time, but the room's been warm and hopefully it'll be fine. So what I'm looking for is a sparkle. I'm looking for it to pour well with a head and keep a head. But above all, I want that lovely IPA taste with a nice hoppy bite. Am I going to get it? Let's find out. So I think this cage is at the end of its natural life, just about. It's gone all sharp. When they go like that, they're not very good. Right. Am I going to get a pop? Let's find out. Oh, ho, ho, ho. I got a pop. I got vapour. I've got carbonation. Right. My good and Carulas glass. Let's have a look how it pours. Okay, so straight away. Let's give it the 45 degree professional barman pour. By person, I should say, of course. Bartender. Tender is the bar. Right. It's a lovely dark ruby stroke brown colour. And I don't know if you can tell on camera, but believe you me, that is crystal clear. I can see all the way through that, despite the dark colour. So I'm very happy with the appearance. The head doesn't seem to be going anywhere quickly, so that's a good thing. Smell-wise, slightly more brown ale smelling actually than I expected. Right, in I go. That is really nice, but it's very much more flavoured like a brown ale than an IPA. Now the hoppiness is there, it's not intense, it's a strong brown ale with some hoppiness. Would I have identified this as an IPA? No. Then again, if you look at some of the uh, IPAs you get over the bar in pubs like Green King IPA, who would identify that as an IPA? So it's definitely better than Green King IPA, put it that way. And it's doubled the percentage at, what am I on? 7.6%, so way better than that rubbish. Now, I've been talking for a bit, the head has shrunk. I can still see carbonation going up. And I think if it was in the right glass, then that head would stay constant. I'm not disappointed with the flavour, but it doesn't exactly do what it says on the tin. Or the bottle, I should say. It's a very good drink. It's the kind of beer I could drink at any time of year. It's not necessarily a summer drink or, a, or an autumn drink or a winter drink or even a spring drink. So I'm happy enough with the result. It's very good flavoured. It's not quite the strong hoppy IPA flavour I was going for, but that's fine. Back to the drawing board. It's still a good beer. I'm still very happy with it and I'm still going to enjoy it. Okay. Cheers, folks. As always, it's been an absolute pleasure and a massive learning curve. And I'll catch you on the next brew. <sighs> Hang on a flipping minute. I am finished. We didn't do the apple IPA, did we? I don't know. Anyway, 
here it is. So the Apple IPA has only been conditioning for two weeks, so it might not have the same amount of carbonation as the other one did. Now this one has come in at somewhere above 8%, but I don't know what percentage because like a fool, I didn't take the correct gravity readings. I didn't do a restarting gravity. So in the end, I've just not even bothered um, with the final gravity. I know what the other one was. It's going to be a little bit more. My experience of doing ciders is that when you add a litre of apple juice, you normally add about 1%, 1.2%. So I'm just going to say that this is going to be over 8%, which is mighty fine for an IPA. Right. Shut up, Stuart. Open it. Am I going to get a tss? It was subtle, but it's vapour. Oh, we love vapour. Right. Let's see how it pours and looks in the glass and it pours and looks just very much like the other one. Looks nice. Nicely carved. Good head forming. Now I want to know if the apple juice has made it taste significantly different. It smells pretty much the same. I'm not getting an apple smell. It is different, it's sweeter. Interesting. I'm still not getting IPA. I'm getting slightly sweeter with a tart finish. It's rather pleasant actually. In fact, I'd go as far as to say, I prefer it, it's less like a brown ale. It's very nice. Sweet, tart at the end, fizzy on the tongue. Unfortunately not retained its head. That could be a symptom of putting juice in. But flavour wise, it's very nice indeed. So I'd be interested to know in the comments, have any of you ever brewed a beer with fruit juice instead of water? Because that's what I'm now thinking. Should I do that? You know, it'd have to be an extract kit, I think. But is it worth doing? Anyway, Another experiment over, another film done. Folks, as always, it's been a pleasure. Cheers to you. And I'm going to catch you on the next brew. <sighs> the film that you've just watched is a Moss Home and Garden production. You can find more by going to www.mosshomeandgarden.co.uk. I'd just like to say thank you very much for supporting my YouTube channel and for watching my films. It really is very much appreciated. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to my YouTube channel in order to receive future updates about the home and garden films which I upload. You can find my YouTube channel by going to www.mosshomeandgarden.co.uk. Please click on the red subscribe button. When you've done that, a little bell will appear. If you press that also, then you'll get future updates about the films which I upload. If you like my films, if you like my style of filming, then you might also like my travel channel, which you will find by going to youtube.com forward slash Stuart Moss or typing www.mosstravel.tv. Again, if you could subscribe to that channel, it would be hugely appreciated. If you'd like to get Moss Home and Garden updates on Facebook, then please open Facebook and do a search for Moss Home and Garden and you will find the page. If you like the page, then you will get future updates on there. And if you'd like to connect on Instagram for home, garden and travel photography, as well as some stories, then my username is Stu Moss, S-T-U-M-O-S-S. -S. If you'd like to connect on Twitter, then my username is at Stuart Moss. And if you'd like to contact me about film usage or any other issue, please just email me on stewmosshomegarden at gmail.com. Once again, thank you very much for supporting my channel, for watching my films. I do appreciate it. I'd just like you all to have a great day.